Okay, um, hi, welcome to Crime Late, where we talk about true crime, or literally anything that piques my interest. Um, so today we are talking about the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing. Um, this, today is gonna be more, um, historical? <laughs> I didn't mean it to be, but it is gonna be, so there's that. Um, oh, I'm your host, Cass. I <laughs> forgot to introduce myself. Um, okay, so Birmingham, Alabama, right? A place now known for peaceful canals, Peaky Blinders, being the birthplace of Ozzy Osbourne. Wasn't always like that. Wasn't always bustling with nightlife, nightlife and diversity. Um, in the early 60s, Birmingham was one of the largest racially split cities in the U.S. Um, MLK called it the most segregated city in the country. Um, Birmingham was founded in 1871 and soon became the center of industrial and commercial work in the state of Alabama. However, it was one of the most segregated and racially based <laughs> based by a cities of America. Um, I, I feel like I can't mention MLK in Birmingham without mentioning um, MLK's letter from Birmingham jail as well. So on um, April 3rd, 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his Southern Christian Leadership Conference and their partners in the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights led a string of protests, marches, and sit-ins against segregation in Birmingham. And by April 12th, MLK and the others were imprisoned. And in a Birmingham prison, um, he wrote the now famous letter. Uh, I'm not gonna go too deep into it, or I'll turn it really into a history lesson, but definitely go read up on it. Um, so, first off, <laughs> um, the church itself was a significant religious place for the back black population um, and for civil rights in general. Um, however, because of this bombing, it was soon just a place filled with pain and suffering. Um, yeah. Um, on Sunday, September 15th, 1963, four members of the regional Ku Klux Klan, um, Thomas Blaine, Robert Chambliss, Bobby Cherry, and alleged Herman Cash. Um, Herman Cash passed away, was never tried for any alleged involvement, so I don't mention him again. Um, they planted 19 or more sticks of dynamite, all hooked up to a timer beneath the steps of the east side of the church. Um, they had planned a right-wing attack, terrorism, and it would lead to a lot of destruction, alright? Um, roughly at 10.22 a.m., an anonymous caller called the church where a 14-year-old girl named Carolyn Maul, I think I'm pronouncing that right, forgive me if I'm wrong, um, she was the acting secretary for the Sunday school. Um, she answered the phone. The call had been said three minutes before hanging up. We're gonna pause there, all right? Like, what do you think she was thinking about or feeling in that moment? Like, is this a prank? Should I call someone? Should I tell someone? Fear, confusion. No matter what she thought or felt, she wouldn't have had the time to act on anything because not even one minute later, the bombs that laced the building exploded. Um, five children were in the basement of the church at the time. Um, they were preparing for a sermon. And if you don't know what a sermon is, it is a talk on religion or a religious moral subject, um, usually given during a church service um, passes of Bible or like a song or whatever. 
um, they were doing a rock that will not roll. Um, the explosion blew a hole, measuring seven feet in the church's back wall. Um, it blew a crater five feet wide and two feet deep in the basement. It destroyed the rear steps of the church. One of the survivors said the explosion shook the entire building and sent the girls' bodies through the air like fragments. Um, it even blew um, a passerby who was riding a motorcycle off of his bike. Um, even more show of destruction was cars um, and windows of properties more than two blocks away were destroyed by the blast. Um, all but one of the church windows were shadows, shattered. Um, the undamaged window was a stained glass window that depicted Jesus Christ leading a group of young children, which is a, yeah. Um, after this, a crowd had formed, some of them slightly injured and surrounded the church. Um, they tried to search the debris for survivors while the police set up barricades. Um, um, while um, several outraged men disrupted and fought the police. Um, nearly 2,000 people of color were on the scene following the explosion. Yeah. Um, so, we're going to move on to the losses. The losses were of four. Um, the first one was Addie Mae Collins, she was 14. Carol Denise McNair, she was 11. Carol Rosemond Robertson, she was 14. And Cynthia Diane, Diane Wesley, sorry, um, she was 14. Um, all four girls were killed in the attack, all pronounced dead on arrival when they arrived at uh, Hillman Emergency Clinic. Um, uh, Addie's younger sister, Sarah Collins, who was age 10 at the time, who was also in the basement uh, restroom, um, was injured and she lost her right eye. That was her um, only um, really like devastating uh, injury. Okay. So, now we're moving on to the aftermath. Um, a lot happened. It was quite crap. Um, I, I, I hate the FBI, but I mean, it's the 1960s. Um, so, in the aftermath of the bombing, black protesters gathered at the scene of the bombing. Police were sent to break up the protests and the violence um, that soon broke out across the city. Many were arrested and it eventually led to um, two men um, being killed uh, before the National Guard being called in to take over. Um, and one of the men being killed was by a police officer, and the other was not. Um, Martha Luther King later spoke before um, 8,000 people at the funeral service for three girls. One of the girls' families had a private funeral. Um, I can't, I didn't find who were the three girls for the mass fu funeral um, service. I sure, I'm sure if I looked harder, which I shouldn't say that, but that, I, literally everywhere I looked, it just said he had a mass, he had a funeral of service for three girls, and I didn't say who the three girls were, um, but I'm sure if I looked harder, I would have found it. Um, 
Um, but he did. Um, although many white supremacists were suspected of committing crime and repeated cries for justice to be given to the lives lost in the bombing, um, it went unanswered for more than a decade. And here's why. It was later found out that the head of the FBI at the time, J. Edgar Hoover, disapproved of the civil rights movement and was holding on to information. So, um, the Federal Bureau of Investigation concluded in 1965 that the bombing was committed by the four KKK members that I said earlier. However, no prosecutions were concluded until 1977 when the case was reopened by Alabama Attorney General Bob Baxley and Robert Champus was tried and convicted of the murder of the first degree. That was for the murder of 11-year-old Carol Denise McNair. (laughs) Sorry, I'm like panting. It's because my- I got angry. (laughs) Oh my god. (laughs) So, Robert Chambliss died in prison in 1985 um what can i say i'm glad (laughs) um after that the case was reopened in 1980 1988 i don't know why i typed that out of order Uh, it was opened in 1977 1980 and 1988 um thomas plan and Bobby Cherry were then put on trial. Um, They were each convicted of four counts of murder and sentenced to life in prison. Um, Because of the outrage of the deaths of the four girls, it helped build and put a bigger push behind the struggles of ending segregation. And that push would lead to a passage of two acts, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Votes Rights the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Um, So, this one was a really short one, but it was a good one. And if I missed anything, let me know. Um, And if there is anything you'd like for me to cover, let me know.